Welcome to the Arena Deckless Podcast. I'm Jerry Thompson. Here with me, as always, is Brian Gottlieb, and we are going to talk some standard. Huge weekend in standard, Gerald. Two very, very big tournaments. One in size, one in importance. Well, that's not to diminish the Red Bull event. Obviously, there's a big payoff for that one, too. But just a, a big, big week in the standard. Do you know You know what I, what I wouldn't give to have Red Bull tweet about me, though? It's funny. I was thinking about that today. I, I'm assuming you are not playing the Red Bull tournament. Is that accurate? Uh, I'm not. And I was thinking, I really bet Jerry would play if the prize was Red Bull related, like a year's supply of Red Bull or something along those lines or a Red Bull sponsor. A year supply? I mean, I, a year supply for me is a lot. I'm not going right. to lie. Currently right. drinking one right now. That might actually exceed the $5,000 prize pool that is presently being offered, though, for you anyway. Like, I, I am almost positive you consume more than $5,000 with a Red Bull in a year. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. Did some That's quick a lot. Maths. We should We should think about that, like, going forward. I, I'm not trying to judge you. I'm not trying to change your lifestyle. But, like, $5,000 with a Red Bull a year is a lot. How? I, no, people spend more than that on Starbucks iced coffee, you know? You're you're probably right. I don't, don't think be, that's the best thing for them to be doing either. No, but. no, of course not. But I'm saying just like in in the grand scheme of things, I am not the most egregious offender. That's all I'm saying. I will, I will give you that. That is true. So yeah, I'm I'm drinking Red Bull right now. If if folks over at Red Bull want to tweet about me, that'd be dope. Or if they want to inquire as to sponsorship opportunities, my email is open. <laughs> It has been open to the Red Bull people for quite some time now. And for whatever reason, this connection is not getting made. I don't understand it. One of these days, maybe. Yeah, maybe maybe the best way in is just just win all their tournaments. Makes so sense. maybe I'm I'm slacking here. But yeah, we have we have that event going on. Uh, 3,500 entrants is what so, I was told. Something like that. Yeah. And I, I think entrance is still open. So it you know might crack 4,000 when we really get down to it. Oh, God. Are you going to talk me into playing this Red Bull event? And then we have the arena PTQ thingy. MCQ weekend, Gerald, I believe is the official name of the arena PTQ thingy. Nobody really knows when these events will happen, if they will happen, but we keep qualifying for them. This is a typically very, very high value tournament. I think it still is. I mean, we, we don't really know. I guess there's some clarity coming soon. I believe the OP folks had like an announcement of an announcement show last week and we're supposed to get some kind of plan going forward. So it'll be interesting to see what that looks like. But previously, this was certainly a hallmark of the new organized play system. Yeah, so for people that were coming to me and basically asking like whether or not they should actually continue to participate in OP and like what my best guess at would be as to like what it means or what it's going to mean, I was typically just telling them that they should participate just as they had been. But after a, a few months of lockdown and stuff, obviously it's getting to the point where it's like, how many people have invites that have gone unused? You know, uh, it's it's got to be a lot at this point. And to me, it means that, uh, especially now in the wake of there being a potential announcement, that there's just going to be some pro tour online. And there's probably, it's, again, this is my best guess, right? And I would imagine that there's going to be a couple of them so that there's not just a ginormous pro tour that's like 5,000 entrants. It, it was getting to the point where there are so many invites out there that before, you know, if you want an invite to a pro tour, you're getting to play in a 400 person tournament with a $200,000 prize pool or something similar. And that EV is quite good, but it's certainly diminishing as the amount of qualified players goes up. I mean, I don't think they would run a 5,000 person pro tour that still only had like $200,000 worth in prizes, right? Like the prizes would go up or they would split it up somehow or whatever. Like they're going to try and keep the equity the same, but regardless, I think that just playing to play and to keep yourself fresh and to just be able to say that you have an invite in your back pocket is pretty rad and that it shouldn't necessarily deter people from, doing what they already enjoy doing. So I, th I think the, the weekend itself is, you know, it's still pretty high value and m the vast majority of people are still going to be playing. Did you see the rumors circulating around today about the pro tour? No. Okay. We're not going to discuss them here. If you're interested, there's some rumors circulating about what the pro tour will look like. 
if these rumors are to be believed, your expectation that they would maintain the equity is false. They're just rumors, though. So who knows if this actually pans yeah, out? Yeah, well, so I don't think that they would try and maintain it, you know, on like a one-to-one ratio or whatever. But like, I also don't think that they're just going to like completely, I don't know, just pull the wool over everyone's eyes or whatever, or just like try to. But regardless- the rumor, like, the rumor is a dramatic price cut. Okay. So again, just a rumor. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't take anything from that until we have the actual announcement. Yeah, I imagine that- you know, they're certainly like taking more of a loss now and it is very difficult to justify the same amount of, of investment course. and everything. So I would imagine some amount of reduction, but I also don't think that they're just going to be like, haha, like same prize pool, but 10x the players. So there's going to be a public backlash too if that happens and they're just going to have to walk it back anyway. So who cares? Should Should there be though? I mean, like these circumstances are so far past unforeseen that it's just like ridiculous. And obviously like in multiple ways, the world not being the same is a hundred percent true, including like the type of returns they are getting on investment in professional magic. And you can say like a contract was already made and there's certain expectations right. when you're participating in this tournament. I get those arguments. I think they're good arguments. And it's part of the reason why my stance on should you participate in OP was a little bit more cautious than yours. Mine was kind of like, well, if you are enjoying OP and this is what you want to do, I don't think you should change that. I think you should live your best life. If you're having fun playing these tournaments, you should certainly do so, but you should dramatically temper your expectations as to what these tournaments are actually going to consist of. And that includes the amount of equity rolled up in these tournaments. Well, you you are the lawyer. I would defer to you as far as like what actually consists of like a legal contract for yeah. like, I, you I know, mean, that's so uncertain in this scenario. You you can make an argument whatever way you want to basically. And right. it all and, would have some merit. And there's also the argument that like, well, now no one has to travel to this event if it is actually being held online. Right. So sure. What, what is the equity difference between you not having to spend upwards of a thousand dollars on like flight and accommodation versus like your equity in the tournament going down and stuff like that. So yeah, I don't know. My, my only point was like, I would expect them to try and make good by the player base. Sure. Obviously given their track history and the things that I have said and done in response to their track history, like it doesn't make a lot of sense for, for me to say that. Like I don't expect them to give like a hundred percent or 110% or whatever, I would expect them to try and do like the bare minimum that gets them the most positive public favor or at least like neutral public favor. Right. Yeah. I I think your perception of them is logical and like there's mostly space for them to be more player leaning. But in general, even when you were protesting against their goals, I think you knew why they were doing what they were doing. They were trying to get the best value on their investment, basically. Yeah, of course. Of course. And, and that's what I'm saying is like, they're, they're going to try and do the bare minimum to get the most positive, favorable outcome, you sure. know? And sure. at some point you cross a line into territory where people are just going to light them up on Twitter. And that has a lot of negative repercussions. And then they're going to have to walk it back. And that's just kind of how things have gone over the last few years. So if if they really are trying to cut it by that much, then, you know, we'll see. Yeah, just rumors. So I feel actually bad even giving it credence when it's that ethereal. Like, we just don't know what's going to happen. But look, nobody loves a good Twitter light up more than I do. But uh, these circumstances are just bonkers. So I hope it gets to a place where both Wizards and the players are hot, happy. That's my main concern. Just that we find a happy medium and everyone can still enjoy something in a very trying time. Yeah. And I mean, for the people who are qualified and we're planning on playing in this event, I don't expect anything to change as a result of that. You know, it's like, well, you already carved out the time to qualify and grind the ladder and everything. I can't imagine that you're just going to like stop playing as a result of this. So, Yeah. Anyway, uh, we can actually talk about standard if you want. Sure. Why don't we get into that? You sound super excited. <laughs> well, I was that clear in my voice. No, I, I I think it's fine. Look, everyone knows my opinion on constructed magic right now is is pretty low. I'm not going to deny that, but the standard's acceptable. Like it's it's not as bad as it seems on its face, I think. There are some unique decks. There's some new decks too, like 
there was a bit of a shakeup, whereas we were concerned that it's just Fires and Team Wreck. And granted, those decks are still here, but their form has changed somewhat. And there's also a brand new deck on the block. It's not one of my favorite decks of all time, but it exists and it's different and it's interesting. So let's talk about it all. I, I think there are enough points of interest and decisions to be made because that's what this is about this is about winning the magic tournament like that's our goal in doing this podcast there's certainly plenty to say in that regard yeah the the format as it is exists the cards that are legal exist you can't do anything to change that currently so what are you going to register this weekend uh just kind of going top down and we'll we'll thumbs up thumbs down each of these decks based on how we feel going into the weekend the first one probably the most popular as of last week, but maybe not going forward is Just Guy Luca. We did basically a whole podcast episode on that last week and talked about how it was the best deck in standard at that point. Are we still feeling that? Yep. My opinion has not changed. I didn't see anything to really push me off of it. I didn't have a stellar showing in the... Man, I don't know the terminology for anything. The, the weekend Fest finals Online things. finals. Yeah. yeah. Not a stellar showing. It didn't claim a huge percentage of the top eight, but the win rates were still good. And there were some other smaller tournaments that went on where actually Just Guy's win rate was preposterous, like 69%. I remember seeing in some 120 person tournament, I believe one of like the LATAM tournaments. So there's that data point. And then we're also looking at a standard challenge that happened this past week where it's like five of the top eight slots. So I... I just didn't see anyone make any real meaningful adaptation. Certainly there's more consideration of this deck in sideboards. People are becoming aware of its tricks. They're more and more ready to play against it. But at the same time, the Jeskai decks are still adapting. There's a lot of cards they can pick up. They're doing a better job of considering spot removal, I think, now. Uh, I'm yep. starting to see more Ether Gusts in the main. I'm starting to see Glass Casket, both of which seem excellent against what's probably the second best deck that we're going to talk about in a moment. But I don't think this deck is out of moves. I think it is able to contemplate the way players are going to attack it. And the way they attacked it this past weekend was through aggression. That worked. That was a solid plan. But I just think Jeskai Luka can go back to the drawing board and come back ready for that aggression as well. Yeah, another thing that is starting to trend up is Defton Clarion. Uh, yep. over some amount of the Shatter of the Skies and even just, you know, some of the flex slots too, just like the random Elspeth is gone in a lot of these lists. And yeah, just having the earlier, cheaper sweeper and also having more sweepers in general, I think is going to benefit them a decent amount. And I mean, they do have a lot of slots to play with. They are playing 80 cards. Uh, there's a lot of cards that we talked about last week where it's like, eh, this is like kind of medium. Is Is this actually great? And I think when it comes down to it, if you need the slot for something else, you can certainly make that concession. Yeah. And so some of the other things I'm seeing floating around, Fire Prophecy is a card which is starting to creep into main decks. I I don't know if I love it. There's also the Red Omen you can play if you want a reusable damage effect. I, I do think Glass Casket is the best way to go just to account for foxes, but there's plenty of options like you mentioned. And these players are picking them up at this point. So if this deck is going to be dethroned, I don't think it's just like small aggression. It's finding the deck with a positive matchup against Jess Kailuka. I don't really know what that is right now. Do you have thoughts? Do you have a hard targeting deck that is just inherently advantaged against this setup? Not necessarily once they adapt because the aggro decks are very one dimensional in the magic fest weekly final thing or not weekly but like you know finals i guess there were two mono red obosh decks in top eight uh the cycling deck is kind of everywhere and yeah flourishing fox is obviously like a very scary card to play against especially if you're leaning on damage based removal and have a bunch of etb tap lands it's just entirely possible that your cards don't line up against that card and they just give you the beatdowns so I liked the fact that people were punishing last week's version of the deck by playing aggressive decks like, you know, Knights and Cycling and Mono Red and stuff like that. But going forward, I would imagine that the Jeskai decks adapt a little bit to that and the aggro decks get less good by a sizable amount. But 
Knights is Mardu and has a lot of copies of uh, Fight for One or Fight with One, Fight as One. There we go. That, that's the card. And that card is actually quite good against like all of their sweeper options. So I don't know. I think that might be the aggro deck that I would actually recommend. Interesting. Uh, I, I just realized too that despite calling it last week, I took away the credit from myself. There, there is a deck which I actually do think effectively targets Jeskai Luka. Uh, that would be Team Quilver. And we're going to talk about more of that, of that in the future, so I won't get into it now. But that yeah. is the best hard target I think there is in the entire format. And I said that going into last weekend's Magic Fest. And as we saw, first place finish, finish for Jason Florent. So there's something there for sure. I, I do think there's other weaknesses, but there's something there. Right. Uh, so I think that Jeskai has the tools to adapt, but we're, we're in one of those states where, I don't know, like last week, Jeskai was the deck to beat. Everyone knew that. And since then, the format has opened up a little bit where I'm sure a lot of the Jeskai players who got beat are going to go back to the drawing board. And then there were a lot of different aggro decks that had success. And I'm sure a lot of people who were were playing you know, different decks and not doing as well are probably going to look to pick up some of those decks. So I imagine like Jeskai's metagame share goes down and kind of like everything else gets propped up a little bit as a result, or at least like these new aggro decks. Sure. So then that makes the format a little bit tougher to actually attack directly because the metagame share is a little bit more spread out. And obviously the the arena tournament is, I don't know, it's it's very hit or miss, especially in the early rounds. You just play against like a lot of very random decks. So yes. I, I would... Caution anyone against hard targeting against anything, especially for like the Red Bull event where it's 3,500 people, which is huge, and it's uh, an open tournament. So yeah, the the metagame is going to be pretty odd for the first few rounds. So I would highly recommend just playing a deck that is generically good and not necessarily something that you're trying to hard target like Jeskai. Yeah, and it seems like Jeskai is just the way to fit the bill for generically good. We talked about perception being that Jeskai didn't have the best weekend, but still its conversion rate from day one to day two, positive 18.8% to 21.9%. Those are good numbers. That points to being a very, very good deck. And like I said, there were some instances of actual broken numbers showing up in some smaller tournaments. So I just don't have any reason to get off this right now. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, it, it gets a thumbs up for me too. If I were playing in one of these events, I think Jeskai and like trying to tune it to be a little bit better against aggro while not sacrificing a lot in other spots would be what I would be trying to do. Love it. Uh, next deck is Boro Cycling. And <laughs> I mean, this deck is gas because it's like 50 cents. Very, very cheap deck. That's true. Widely represented on a lot of platforms because of that fact. It's something to consider, and I try not to do this too much, but especially when it comes to these online tournaments where you know players might not be deeply invested in arena. They not, might not be full-time arena players, and maybe they qualified for the MCQ weekend through Limited, and they don't want to spend all the wild cards. Well, here's your answer. Boreal Cycling 100%. I would expect it to be overrepresented relative to how good it is. And while I do think it's good... I think it's best when people aren't adapting to it. And as I mentioned, I'm starting to see decks adapt to it. Yeah, it's it's sort of one-dimensional. Because, I mean, you, you have the creatures that provide, like, a very wide variety of threats. And then you have, like, Zenith Flare to finish. But, like, really, that's all you have to contend with. And because they're a Luris deck, they also can't really sideboard in too much. You know, it's like, they're not going to have like a go big plan against you, right? It's like, no, nah, they're going to pick up a couple different cards, uh, but mostly just be on the same plan. And as long as you can stem the early aggression and not get fireballed, then I think you're pretty good. Yeah, you know what they're going to bring to the table and it's going to be early aggression, big fireball in the end. I feel like this deck kind of fills a role that previously actual burn decks would occasionally yeah. Kill, where there just wasn't like good interaction for this mode of killing you. So they were able to do it with impunity. But now as people contemplate this deck, it's not working anymore. And you're seeing weird cards get the job done. I've seen the wanderer all over the place, which <laughs> yeah, I, I've rolled my eyes at it first. And I'm like, oh, actually, yeah, this is probably perfect. It does exactly what you want. Yeah. 
I, I like the Wanderer at least, you know, just as like a one of in your board or something. It just kind of like locks the game up once you have enough spot removal. The problem, the big problem with the cycling deck is like it, the, the power level is so different when you have Fox on turn one and when you don't. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Someone it's, mentioned, imagine this deck if Once Upon a Time was still around and you can reliably get your Fox. Yeah. Well, even that, I mean, they, they play 18 lands, 14 of them are turn one white sources, uh, which is... It's it's a good amount, obviously, but it's still like kind of low. So you could you could even just like miss on having an untapped white source for the fox. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to miss it. And look, the deck that gets over it. Like it plays well in a longer game. It has repeated sources of damage. It has the big fireballs at the end. So it's not like you're doomed if you miss turn one fox. But the difference is big. Yes, I don't know. I think the the lack of depth is sort of a death knell for this deck maybe not for this weekend but almost certainly for like the weekend after if this deck continues to put up numbers so i would thumbs down it for this weekend you know people are going to have things like the wanderer and just be a, a little bit more prepared to fight you and like we mentioned you know people are putting more spot removal in their deck not necessarily just for this deck but definitely gets caught in the crossfire especially when it's like oh well maybe i won't play fire prophecy i'll just play glass casket to make sure i can kill the fox well then you're gonna get a a lot fewer free wins yeah and the combination of urian plus glass casket is actually like good against fox because you're resetting it and then you can catch the second fox which got bigger so sure it's just a problem card for you in general I think the tides already started turning against this deck. It had 15.6% of the field on day one of the weekend finals, uh, 14.1% on day two. So loss percentage of the field as we move to day two, I think that's just reflective of people already contemplating it. So if that continues to happen, I think things only get worse. And I am also going to go with a thumbs down for Boral Cycling. I think the deck is solid. This just isn't the moment for it. Yep. Uh, next one, relatively new deck, Teamer Elementals with Urian as the companion and going very big up to like Genesis Ultimatum, basically trying to put very quick Agent of Treacheries into play, uh, sort of mm-hmm. like Jeskai Luka, but is heavily reliant on these creatures to do so, which makes me like this deck a lot less than just playing normal Jeskai the biggest thumbs down I could possibly give this deck is what it gets. And I patted myself on the back before for calling Teamer Adventures. I also mentioned this deck as a potential option. Sorry. I'm sorry if you got tricked into playing this deck. It's just not good. The problem you mentioned with creatures means that while Jeskai Luka has adaptations it can make to aggression, this deck does not. And I think it just got absolutely blown out of the water in this tournament, as well as some other ones. I'm seeing uh, 9.4% of day one, 6.3% of day two. So a pretty massive drop off there. But I also saw, I think in that same Latam tournament, this deck had like a very small sample size, but a 19% <laughs> match win percentage, which is probably That's, the worst I've ever seen. It's not good, Brian. Yeah, it was like, it wasn't like one person playing it either. It was like eight people, which is still very small, but. Those are scary numbers. That's that's a lot of people just getting hammered, though. <laughs> yes, just getting soundly beaten. And like I said, I don't think that this deck stands up to aggression well at all. So uh, huge thumbs down here. I don't think you can talk yourself into playing this deck this weekend. Well, you want to talk about it so badly, you keep bringing it up. Let's just talk about Teamer Adventures now. Okay. I think it was a great choice last weekend. I think it was... When you anticipate Jeskai Luka will be a huge percentage of the field, and it was the most played deck, I probably would have anticipated a higher percentage, honestly, at 18.8%. I would have guessed somewhere around 25%. If you think that number continues to climb, they just weren't thinking about dealing with the type of end games that Team Rear Adventures could set up. And as I mentioned, this deck does have the capability to go bigger, and it achieved that goal uh, in the finals, went off. Now, Granted, there was some misclicking going on in the semifinals that even got to the point where Team Uh, Adventures could make it to the finals. PV had a situation where he relied on the auto tapper and it just doomed him. Um, Left left that castle open, did it? I I don't remember what the exact configuration was, but it left him unable to cast the second counterspell. And so the result dramatically changed of the tournament. Still, I think Team Adventure was a very, very fine choice for last weekend. But if I started seeing a lot of this deck on the ladder and I was a Jeskai Luka player, 
I think about my moves and they're all there. You can, you can answer a clover. You can answer the edge wall innkeeper and find ways to deal with their value engines. Again, so, more spot removal. You yeah. start moving away from shatter the sky. You play things like glass casket, fire prophecy, whatever. You actually get to kill an innkeeper. That's huge. Yeah. And I think that's the main difference why I am lower on team adventures coming into this weekend. I'm not off it. Did we do thumbs in the middle here? Is that allowed? Given that both of these tournaments are very large, I I would solidly thumbs down this deck, I think, because it might be good against like the, the top tier, or at least like last weekend's top tier. But if there's just going to be like a bunch of aggro decks and stuff, I, I would just solidly thumbs down this deck. Okay. If you are an absolute master with Teamer Adventures, I, Do will your let thing. You, I will let you take the thumbs up. Otherwise, it's a thumbs down. So it equates somewhere about to a thumbs in the middle. But for most of you listening, thumbs down on this deck. I would solidly thumbs down. And I just, I want people to know that. I don't, I don't think this deck is going to do well in either tournament. Okay. Up next, we have Teamer Wreck. What do you think I'm going to rate this deck? Uh, this is your biggest thumbs up possible. You love Teamer Reclamation. I understand why, just like Jessica, I, Luca can make the moves. So can Teamer Wreck. And this was reflected in the tournament results. 17.2% 7 of the field on day one. It went up to 21.9% on day two. So that was the biggest jump, I believe, in at least among the large sample size decks. Also put it on pace with Jeskai Luca as being the most played deck in day two. So you got to account for this one. I agree that you have to account for it. I would thumbs down this deck. When when things are getting to the point where you, you just you have said to... Th you said thumbs down. Thumbs down. Thumbs, thumbs very down. Thumbs very wow. down. I, I, would, okay. I would thumbs down... Uh, I guess Teamer Adventures more than this deck, but not by much. So in order to compete, Teamer Wreck basically needs to play like six to eight counter spells main deck. And at that point, you are pretty good against a lot of the blue decks, but you're very, very bad against just any sort of aggressive deck. So yes, if you want to use Teamer Wreck to hard target a lot of these things, you certainly can do that. I just don't think that that's a recipe for, for success. Okay. So you don't have some secret deck list you're, you're holding out from all of us where you've solved all these problems and you think you can absolutely get the entire meta game with your setup? What I would do if you feel like you have to main deck like six counter spells to be competitive against like all these Narsets, instead of playing spot removal spells, which kind of sucks because of like Fox and stuff, I would want to lean more on Flame Sweep to actually catch like the Rakdos stacks and mono red and knights and stuff like that i think you need you need something that's going to be worth like two or three cards in that slot like you can't just like you know dragon fire their grizzly bear and hope that that's going to carry you because it's not storm's wrath not doing enough for you uh storm's wrath is pretty slow and i think flame sweep against the majority of these decks is just good enough okay like fox fox is the one problem though right and right. that just makes me think that you should go back to playing some amount of brazen borrowers too any opinion on Ivan Flock stack that he played to the top eight? Mostly hate it. Uh, I, I remember that, you know, he's playing four tornadoes and, and that sort of stuff, but mm -hmm. I don't remember the exact specifics. Okay. But you remember you were off it. It was four mystical dispute main. I think they, that's one of the big characteristics. Scorching dragon fire for spot removal. Yeah, I think you have to play some amount of disputes. It's like negate, dispute, and neutralize are like the counter spells that you get to play with. So my list would probably be like three Flame Sweep, two Borrower, three Uro, 28 Land. I would still play Ops and then use Ops to allow me to shave a bunch of clunky cards. I know that uh, Flock also had three Castle Vantress, which I just don't understand. Y'all, like, you only activate Vantress when you're losing. It rarely helps you actually win those games. And it means that, like, he wants to play four Fable Passage because of the Uros, and then he only gets to play five Basics. It's just a Accurate. disaster. It's a disaster. Accurate. I, I can't tell you how many times I played Team Rec and just would be sitting in a, in a position where I felt like I had gotten all my stuff together and I had no payoff. And I was so reliant on being able to Castle Vantress, untap, do something else, and just use that window to close the game out. Like, And I can't tell you how many games I also lost where I activated Castle Vantress four times and found nothing. So like, I, I just don't know how you win games without Castle Vantress. I guess you tend to go much higher on Chemistry's Insight than most people right. do. Is that accurate? 
Yeah, I mean, recently I've I've been doing basically what a lot of people are doing now, which is like one main, one board. Okay. And that's mostly a, a concession to the aggressive decks is that like you can't, you know, just draw a bunch of chemistries in game one. But like now you might just be at the point where it, it just doesn't matter. Like either you draw flame soup or you lose basically. Lord, I, I, I just think like the reduced numbers of big payoffs, like we're down to one Thassa's intervention in Phlox deck. And a lot of this is to make room for the shark typhoons. You got to have some way of finding that KO punch and you're just not able to turn as quickly as you were previously with something like Thassa's intervention or get your explosions online as quickly. So I get the need for Castle of Antris. Your complaint about basics though, very valid for sure. Yeah, I mean, especially when you're playing a bunch of counter spells, you're anticipating to play against a, a bunch of like mid range decks and stuff where the games are going to go long. I mean, I guess that is a reason why you would want Vantress, but I mean, I would much rather have insight in those spots than just like find space for that. Like, even if you're playing the the four shark thingies, you know, like you're going to have plenty to use your mana on. I just don't understand when you actually have time to activate Vantress and how it's like not screwing you in the early game or like not running you out of basics. And I don't know. What if it's just a slot consideration thing though? Like you can get to 28 lands by the fact that you're playing this almost spell like land. I, I would just play 28 land anyway, if you're playing, well, I guess when I was, when I was on four spiral and four row, I definitely wanted 28 land. Right. But if you're cutting in Uro then you can probably play 27, especially if you have four ops. But I don't know. Like, I, I wouldn't even count Vantress as, like, a spell. Just because I just, I don't think you really activate it, and I don't think it actually does anything. Okay. Castle Vantress hater, on record. I hate it. It's probably my least favorite card in, like, the last five years. <laughs> that is crazy. Of all the cards that have cursed magic over the last five years, Castle Vantress is the one that draws your ire. Yeah, I I just absolutely hate it. Okay, different strokes for different folks. No, nah, man, it's just it's so bad. It's so, obviously it's great with fires, you know, like your your lands just sit there; they don't do anything. But right. it's way different in this deck, and yeah, it it just goes to show. It's like I I want to use my mana to actively do things, and Vantress does nothing. See, that's where you and I differ. Is I want to use my mana to do nothing. That's my ideal situation. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, I would I would thumbs down Team Arec if if I wanted to play a deck that was like even remotely similar that had a better shot. I think Jeskai Luka is just a better choice. I don't have a strong opinion on this one. I know that's a bit of a cop out. I, I don't really get a sense that it's a poor choice for this weekend. It also doesn't feel like a great choice for me. I, I mean, I can't give two thumbs in the middle in a row. So just to be contrarian, I'll give this a thumbs up. I think it's not a top tier choice, but it is an acceptable choice. Yeah, let me just say one one other thing real quick. Like, things just get to a point where you're building a deck and tuning a deck, and I kind of hit this wall with Team Rex specifically, where you just have to make so many concessions to be viable that you're just like, okay, I'm just a bad something else. Right. And when you are like, okay, I have to play eight counter spells main deck in order to reliably have a chance against Narset, and then it's just like you don't have a counter spell early or your lands sequence weird or they win the die roll and get under your neutralizer order, and they just resolve it to fairy. You're just like, well, damn it. You know, like now none of your cards work. So you're just jumping through all of these hoops to try and solve a problem that would be better solved playing anything else. You don't think dragon fire, shark typhoon, storms, wrath, they do anything to alleviate those concerns. Neither of those cards by themselves kills a Teferi. Right. That's the problem. I will, I will say that. Shark Typhoon shouldn't kill Teferi. It does a lot. Like people are minusing their Teferis way too much in a format where that card exists at the top tiers of play. That will not be the case. So, right. I mean, they're they're going to re and especially a lot of people are cutting Borrower too. So it's just like, well, I'll just plus this Teferi, and it's just never going to die. Right. And I've had similar problems in post board games where I have Fry, and it's like they play Teferi. I don't have an answer immediately. I find a fry later and I still need to tag team that with something else to actually get rid of it. And it's, it is very annoying, man. It's, yeah. it's really hard to overcome all of this nonsense. I feel you. So big thumbs down, play something else, find a better way to solve your problems. 
Uh, next up, we have Monored Obosh. I think this is fine. It is better when the decks were like, I have foreshadowed the sky and no other way to interact with you. And it certainly puts people on a better clock than any of the sacrifice decks do because you know, Priest of Forgotten Gods, Mayhem Devil, do you actually want these cards against Turbo Agent of Treachery? Like, no. That's not really what you want to be doing. I think that you do just want to be killing people. So this was a good deck. Again, people are going to adapt. Your deck is going to get worse. Maybe not enough worse to have it actually matter because Obosh is a house. But play Blazing Volley in this deck, I guess, if you're going to play it, just because I would anticipate some amount of mirrors. Good pickup for sure. I am going to give this deck a thumbs up because I anticipate some number of this deck will be in contention. When the end of the day comes, it, it's powerful, it is consistent, it does the same thing over and over. And if people aren't hard slanting towards you, then you get a lot of advantage situation. I do think, however, in the end, the people who succeed in this tournament, when push comes to shove, will be the people who accounted for these creature-based decks, as we've talked about at length. Uh, Mono Red Obach falls under that same umbrella. It could have a, gr a good day, it's not going to have a great day. So slight thumbs up for Mono Red Obosh. Uh, just basically on like build quality, I would say. It, it's the best version of this type of deck we have right now. You, you play a bunch of one mana one ones, man. I mean, <laughs> you, you don't have a lot of options for build quality. It's like how many Phoenix of Ash do you play or whatever? Like, yep. Not a, not a whole lot of choices, but obviously those choices are going to matter. I would, I, I basically agree with you, but that leads me to like slight thumbs down this thing. I don't know. It sounds like we're we're very close to a similar opinion. We've just decided basically our personalities are shining through. I'm going glass half full. You're going glass half empty. Hey, I'm the I'm the positive one in this relationship. What are, we, what are you talking about? Uh, if that's the point we've hit, then things have really gone astray. Uh, Racto sacrifice, big thumbs down. Yeah, I don't really know what this deck is doing anymore. I, again, it's it's got a bunch of good cards. Obosh very much included in that mix. Although a lot of these decks are playing worse. Fine, I, I guess. I, I don't really care what you do. I don't think it makes a huge difference. Both are leaning on the power of Mayhem Devil. Uh, I've seen some builds with like Judith starting to float around, which now we finally get to be right about that card just so, so long afterwards. So if Judith builds do well, then I'm really into this deck. All it took was you not being able to play even mana cards. <laughs> we had to exclude half the cards in magic the gathering for that card to actually matter our number one card in the set no nah, i mean J judith is good she's she shown up in a few spots and was was in the initial obosh list you know it wasn't like oh like now she's seeing play or whatever i think i think the card is good we've just lived in this world where you know these mid-range aristocrats type of things haven't been super powerful and I think we're still there. You know, it's just like if you if you can only play odd mana cost cards, I guess Judith makes the cut. What I would do if I were playing Sacrifice and was allergic to Obosh for some reason, because I mean, I guess if I want to play Obosh, I would play Mono Red. So let's say I'm allergic to Obosh. I would probably play Luris with a bunch of Kaya's Ghost Forms and just like pick on the people who are trying to beat you with uh shatter the skies and whatnot but okay i don't know still still obviously not a great plan but i think that that's reasonable i could also see the white black decks being good i like white black for its capability to avoid combat like that seems promising to me right now yeah and i i like the pride mate versions i played a bit with them uh i, th I thought they were solid it's just really hard to play on such a lower power level than what the top tier of decks is doing. Like, Oh the, yeah. The fires you're, decks are just doing some absurd stuff. You're and, in for a slog for sure. Right. All right. So thumbs down. I, I, I'm not targeting anything effectively at this point with this deck. It, I recognize it is a fine deck. Again, this is a type of deck that has the capability of putting a deck into the top eight at the end of the day, but it's it's not going to dominate the metagame. And I actually want to take a peek at how it did this past weekend, now that I mentioned that. As a glass half full kind of dude, I just want to find the silver lining with this archetype. I will give it a resounding thumbs down still. Rakdos Sacrifice relying on Obosh the Prey Piercer was 3.9% of the field on day one. On day two, 3.1% of the field. Not great. Meanwhile, 
Naracto sacrifice leaning on Loris of the th- of the Dream Den. 3.9% of the field on day one. So same sample size. Gerald, would you like to take a guess of its day two percentage? 1%. Zero percent. Guess. Zero Luris players making day two. Don't don't know what to make of that. What about Orzov sacrifice? Any Orzov sacrifice on that list? Uh, I see Orzov Auras didn't make day two. I think only one player playing it. This is a this is a small tournament. 128 players participating, so none of these are very large sample sizes. You can't take too much away from them, but uh, no no Orzov sacrifice in the mix here. Sad. All right, on to Bant Urian. Like this deck. Want to like this deck? Basically, just a worse version of Jeskai Luka. So gonna thumbs down it. Yeah, we know PV locking up a top eight appearance. Possibly should have had the finals appearance before the unfortunate misclick incident with Bant. Uh, 7% of the field on day one, 9.4% of the field on day two. Still doing all right. Still a good conversion rate. I still think this deck is good. I still don't know why I would play it over Jeskai Luka. Uh, I I mean, I guess if you are just more comfortable with this deck, then I can give you a tentative thumbs up. But for the vast majority of the population, again, it's a thumbs down just because you have a better option out there. Yeah. Uh, what about Winoda? Don't know what to make of this deck. Again, I like that it is a way to get to faster Asian of Treacheries. So like if we decide this is the best end game, then let's just race to it. And I thought that some of what team or elementals could potentially do didn't really do it all that well. Winoda did it better. The spot removal concerns don't really affect you all that much as Winota because you tend to have token makers and you get a little wide and you don't have to go huge with your Winota. If you just get a few searches, you'll generally do okay. But the proliferation of smaller sweepers like Deafening Clarion is very, very problematic. And that's going to bring this deck down a little bit this weekend from where it was last weekend. I think if you had asked me last weekend, I would have been a slight thumbs up. This weekend, I'm going to go with a slight thumbs down for Just Kai Winoda. Yeah, I mostly agree with you. I think this deck, since it's been around, has leaned a little bit too heavily on just ensuring that it has things to attack with when it can probably just calm that down a little bit because this deck plays so many bad creatures when you could just play interaction and help yourself along that way. Yeah, that seems fine. Get a little card quality back and actually account for what's going on in the format as opposed to being a straight goldfish. I don't know. I I mean, every deck has to justify itself, right? There has to be a reason for a deck to exist. And if you start doing that, what are you better than? Your best feature before was racing to the end game. Now you're this weird mid-range deck with a combo kill. I I guess that sounds okay, but are you just worse Jeskai Luka at that point? Yeah. Yeah, and that's mostly how I feel, except, you know, you have the ability to spike an agent a turn early, but you still have a fail rate there, too. So it's, I don't know. I I would basically be looking for a way to maintain kind of what this deck is already doing and what it's decent at, but just build in some defensive measures against decks that are trying to do similar things and not just rely on, like, turn four window to spike an agent and then hope that things continue to go well from there sure so if you want to play like dispute main or teferi or something like that like i am all about that just cut some of the bad creatures because yeah you have plenty of them yeah makes sense to me uh still still thumbs down unless you can break it i don't know seems tough though team adventures was next on the list but we talked about that already so just guy fires why yeah. Like I, I don't I don't know that it's bad. I don't know that I'm off it. And we talked about a bunch of spots where Clarion is good again. So that's nice. I mean, you you pick that up, but also you could still play Clarion and Jeskai Luka. Right. And I think your end game is just better. So I guess if you were doing this, you have to be really sure that Karuga is where you want to be. Like you have to really value having access to that card. And uh, time has proven it to be mostly worse than Urian. And this deck to be mostly worse than the Urian deck, I'm kind of off it. I, I Again, I can't justify it. It seems like a worse version of Jeskai Luka. Yeah, I agree. Uh, this this deck 
kind of like plagued the format for a very long time. No matter how often we said it was bad, it refused to die. And now I think it's actually going to die. It took a long time and it took a lot of us probably being wrong about it. But now we're going to pretend like we were always right. We nailed it. Jeskai fires. Never any good. We knew Jeskai Luka would come and take the throne. There was like a two week period where we actually liked fires. Yeah, I mean, I I got to the point where I would admit I was the problem. I still don't didn't believe you could actually <laughs> win with fires, but that's yeah, as far yeah. along as I ever got. Right, fires is your collected company, effectively. Correct, my new collected company. No, I I went with Jeskai Luca. It was just the, the I think Cavalier of Flame is my new collected company. Ooh, I don't know. I like the Cavalier. I can't say that I've really won a whole lot with it. <laughs> you just like it in principle. Yeah. Just in theory, but in practice, obviously things are much worse. But yeah, Just Guy Fires not not doing a whole lot of good stuff that, again, can't be done better with other decks. Team Elementals, Team Wreck also have the same problems. Van Urien kind of has the same problem. Recto Sacrifice. So people have found the better ways to do these things and like accomplish similar goals. And I there, there's just like no reason to stick with it. There can only be one fires deck. Uh, I mostly think that's true. Yeah. It makes sense, right? Like you find the best possible thing to do with it. And once you have that, why are you doing the other things? Right. It's like gruel fires. Like it's nice. It's cute. It's fun. But why, why are we doing this? It is cute. I, one thing that I will say about gruel fires is that I do think that there's room for a bigger aggro deck. Uh, I don't think that Gruel Fires is necessarily it or that Gruel is it. I think in an ideal world, there would be like a good Gruel deck that we could turn to. I've tried. I, I thought I had decent ones, but they haven't quite panned out. Okay. Uh, I mean, I saw like some some lists on the CFP Twitter of Gruel doing okay or whatever. You know, like we're we're talking about the problem that Flourishing Fox produces for a lot of people. And I think Gruel, in theory, could do a good job of that also. But mm -hmm. then you're playing Gruel. Right. And your mana is never going to work in a million years. So. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I, I feel like big creatures, gem razor, like there should be a recipe there, but there, there probably just isn't. And maybe actually what people should be doing is playing like green black. That might make more sense. To I've me. seen it floating around. I wasn't crazy about the list I saw, but yes, there, there's a lot of the same stuff going on where you can start to make a case for green black. Maybe it's it's rotting Regisaur's time. I was doing a lot of lot rotting Regisaur with mono black Obosh for a while. The problem became how easily it was chump blocked in the format. And I think that still holds right now. It does hold. I wonder if there's anything you can do about that. Probably probably not in specifically mono red Obosh, but I don't know. Maybe I don't know. We're gonna talk about knights, but uh let's let's Embercleave that bad boy. Let's let's yeah. kick it old school. Oh, Embercleave sounds good. It's just you don't get to play a companion as soon as you put amber cleave in your deck for the oh most yeah part. oh yeah i know so i don't think you can do that i think that's just a really bad idea well uh winota in theory can get away with no companion team or wreck doesn't have a companion i think he gave both those decks thumbs down and i think that might be part of the reason why maybe it's hard to say who could who could possibly know the answer to that right uh azorius control how do you feel about why? this one? Why? You know I want to love this deck, but why? I, there's the Bant deck that does 10 times more powerful stuff, actually accelerates its mana. Like Before we figured out this format, I, I thought Azorius Control was okay because it was like a good Urian deck, but there's better Urian decks. And you have to really believe counter spells are incredible in the format before you go down the road of Azorius Control. And they're not. I mean, maybe they are until there's a Teferi on the battlefield, but there's a lot of Teferis, so... I, I just can't bring myself to play this deck as much as I want to. So I don't like pigeonholing your team of rec deck into like having to play a bunch of counter spells. I like it if your deck is naturally good at playing counter spells and Azorius control, especially the Urian ones. Like you, you have plenty of space for a lot of Dovin's vetoes and mystical disputes and you have the glass caskets and everything. The problem is, is like the closing power basically like mm -hmm. can you actually take full control of a game and beat someone before they actually resolve an agent of treachery against you and i'm I, I think that's more dubious but 
I think that in the early game, Missouri's control is going to win, and then you just need to find a way to actually close. And I'm not sure what the best way to do that is. You could look at going back to Archon. I think that's actually pretty reasonable. The body is okay right now. You can really generate some nice momentum. That's a enters the battlefield trigger, right? So it would work with Urian. I thought it might have been a cast. I don't know. No, it is ETB. Okay, so so there's something there that doesn't sound awful to me, but I I don't like four mana sorcery creature against decks that are just going to have like dead spot removal against you anyway. Like I don't think that that's the way to do it. I if anything, I was thinking like maybe you try and play it more like flashy and just have like brazen borrower shark tornado and like yeah, I'm sure you them. already have max shark typhoon in this deck. Like yeah, no yeah, but like borrower point. borrower is a card that not all these decks are playing. Borrower is cool. Yeah, I like that. And that that might be a way to do it. So I don't know. I could I could see that being good, but. But if that was good, couldn't you just do the same thing in Bant and have access to Growth Spiral and Uro? Yeah, but I'm not necessarily sure that that's actually better if you're not like really trying to lean on Uro for fighting these matchups. Like when Bant started, it was way more green, and now it is just blue white with like Uro and Growth Spiral, and I don't think that that's necessarily right. It's it's part of the reason why I think that Bant is just a bad Jess guy. Could you see a world where it's right to just play Growth Spiral? I don't know. At that point, it's just like, why would I want to Spiral when I could just have more counter spells and Brazen Borrowers if that's if that's what it takes to actually win, you know? It just feels like these decks have to get to a place where their impactful plays are happening ahead of schedule. And if they're not, you're not going to be able to overcome the huge swings that the other decks Yeah, are you're... Able. You're trying to do like five mana stuff and I'm not necessarily trying to do that. Yeah. You want to stay lower to the ground. Right. Yeah. I see where your head's at. I I mean, I guess like at least you're trying to find a reason to justify Azorius control. I am just putting forth a bad version of Bant basically. Yes. Yeah. Makes sense. Anyway, I'm going to thumbs down Azorius uh, based on the list that currently exists. However, I do think that if, you are in the place to actually try and work on something and like try and break the format. This might be a good place to start. Okay. Interesting. And one of the other things I want to talk about is just like flash in general. And I think flash last week was probably pretty good. And, you know, now there's a lot of different aggro decks and you're going to struggle against those. So I would just not even bother. Yeah. You you can't fix that problem for flash. Unfortunately, as soon as you're getting attacked, things get bad getting an attack now i think there are versions of demir that can probably play both ways but it's gonna require a lot of work a lot of fine tuning and probably a lot of sacrifices to be made in matchups that should otherwise be good plus you don't get to play a companion so already the deck is stacked against you yeah i mean it, dude it doesn't matter it's like the c dash or octopus is your companion right like that thing puts you off guards you're good uh, I mean, the companions, you just always have them, though. Like, if you've played if you've played the blue flash decks, you know the difference in games when you have early Sea Dash or Octopus versus not having it. And yeah, of course. Those of course. games happen with regularity, so you, you can't really overlook that fact. That's why you play Demir and you have Slither Wisp, so you have so many Octopi, so many engines. I tried. I, it was close. It was fine. It, it just felt like a different era of magic, honestly. It felt like I was doing something that didn't line up with what everyone else was doing. Dude, that is definitely true. Trying to, like, you know, just play Doom Blade and three mana X2s and <laughs> just hope it all works out. Like, yep. it, it was nice sometimes, you know? But regardless, uh, I think Brineborn Cutthroat is probably good. Okay. Maybe the rest of it just stinks. Like, Cutthroat and Borrower. Maybe just put those in blue eye control and see what happens. Interesting. And interesting is one word that that is code for bad. Yeah, probably bad, but and th- legitimately interesting. Like I want to see how bad it is. Yeah. And then when you cast your shadow of the sky, you can actually draw a card off your cutthroat dying. Oh, sold. Yeah. It doesn't get any better than drawing off your own shadow of the sky. <laughs> uh, last up knights. I think this deck might be good. The mana looks like just atrocious and a nightmare, but. This, this deck, in theory, is doing the things that I want to be doing. Mm, it's got a companion, powerful creatures, a little bit more stickiness than 
some of the other aggressive decks, not quite as fragile as something like Mono Red. So I understand where you're coming from. And you mentioned Fight as One, possibly an important card in the format. Yeah. So this this is going to be my, my Dark Horse pick, I think. I'm going to thumbs up this one uh, relatively enthusiastically, and we'll see what happens. I'll give you a thumbs up, too, just because I previously agreed or disagreed with you just to spite you. Now I'm going to <laughs> agree with you to bring you back up. Hell yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, no problem. Yeah, overall, though, I think it is just tuning Jeskai Luka. I think you change, you know, like six cards in the main deck, and you are looking at having a pretty good weekend for yourself. You're doing something powerful. You have a bunch of reasonable interaction. I think you're pretty good against just, you know, random decks in general. So I'd be hard-pressed to find a better choice than that, actually. That would be my play, too. I'm sorry. I know that's not very exciting, not very interesting. Uh, If you're somehow not familiar with this deck yet, I will tell you that LSV wrote a great deck primer over on CFB where I I honestly think you could just read it and be at if, if you're the type of person who doesn't need a lot of games, you could be at a very high capacity very quickly if you just study his article. So there's no excuses if you haven't picked up Jess Kai Luka yet. You have time. You can get ready for this weekend. Pick up the W. Well, I'm expecting big things from Jess Guy and Fight is One, but that is going to do it for this week, uh, except for the question portion of the show every week. We solicit the fine folks in our Discord for their burning questions. And the question that we arbitrarily select to answer is going to get a very fine enamel arena deckless pin that you can only get by having your question selected. And this week, we have selected a question from Emma, who says, what do you think is the biggest thing that online TOs or tournaments are missing right now? What can they do to fill the gap? And Emma directly added you. So I'm, I'm just going to leave it to you. She does not care what you think, Gerald. So I will field this one. Uh, first, I miss you, Emma. Hello. Second, there is something missing, right? Like th- there's just something that, and like you could make it really simple. You could just say it's about the gathering. And we all know that. We all know we are desperately wanting to get together in a tournament setting right now it's gonna be a while we're gonna have to tough that one out but there's something else going on with these tournaments where like the only thing i can relay is a story about playing like the fandom legends tournaments last year those were fun and there was like a good banter between rounds with the people participating and it 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 just really felt special it's like it felt like a special online tournament and i'm not just saying that because i won a bunch of them it was like legitimately i looked forward to them and had a good time every week and it seems like now there's a bunch of navigation that goes on and you have to go through a discord of people angrily yelling at you and this is more the magic fest stuff it sounds like mtg melee is doing a really excellent job organizing tournaments uh, so props to them for putting it all together. But there, there is a social element that's missing from any form of online magic right now. And I guess maybe you just can't fix that. Maybe this is just like an empty complaint that we're just going to have to deal with. Or maybe there's other ways to fill that gap. Maybe it's about you know fostering a more collaborative environment where we message our opponents after games and congratulate them on a good game and their wins or commiserate with their losses and just find some way to bring back that human element. I I think that's what's missing more than anything else. There's also the ease factor. Like if I could just click on something in my client, I would be a hundred times more likely to play these tournaments. I know that sounds dumb. Like it's really not that hard to go through the registration steps, but humans are simple creatures. We just want stuff laid out before us and like why are iphones popular because they're easy and why did the apps that succeed succeed because they're easy it's just simple you user interfaces mean a lot and those are 100 percent lacking right now which is pretty crazy like i don't know how you have a game like magic the gathering and don't prioritize tournaments in your client i mean i guess with the mcq weekend those are in client so that's nice it's good the didn't, the other didn't stuff start though, that way though 
it it didn't correct and they had to make that change having made that change you would like to see them open that up a little bit more and find more ways to make tournaments happen in the client but that was not a priority up to this point i don't know that it is now either i haven't really heard much about that you know we know some of the things that are coming down the pipe for arena i don't remember like in client tournaments really being a big one so that's something that springs to mind as well. I'm sure there's a host of other stuff that could really tighten up the online experience, but those are the two that immediately stand out to me. The thing that is missing to me is just like these tournaments all seem kind of invisible. Huh. Like they're happening and I see the deck lists and I see the names and it's like there's there's coverage, you know, but it, I don't know. It just doesn't have the same amount of weight as even like, an SCG tour event, you know, it's like, you don't right. necessarily see the people like writing tournament reports or talking about like the tournament as it's happening on Twitter or whatever. It's just like, for whatever reason, there's, there's just like not enough stuff happening like around it where like the tournament is happening and people are playing in it. And then that that's kind of it, you know, and then you kind of get like the, the TLDR at the end, I guess. Do you think there's a possibility that's reflective of how you engage with the game? Like you're yes. not a big Twitch fan. You follow all the people from the SCG tour. So you see their updates. Whereas this trends a little bit larger. I mean, I, well, I do have a sense of what you're saying and like, I kind of agree, but I also think that I've seen some of the things that you're talking about. Like I've seen yeah. the discussion around it and the tweet threads about records and things like that. Okay. I haven't seen like tweet threads really. You know, but just in general, it feels less than than the other events. And I think that that is kind of what's missing for it for me. You know, how would, how would you fix that? I think that more has to go on for like the promotion of the tournament than just having it happen and then like tweeting out deck lists and like even just doing coverage of it. Right. Because like coverage is great but it's still only like two people you know if you're doing like one match per round maybe you get in like a second match or whatever it's like you're not seeing a, a big enough portion of the actual tournament do you think production plays into it because obviously like production is very limited and this may not be obviously, something that can be fixed yeah. but but do you think like having a typical news desk type setup where you throw it at the news desk like basically do it like a mini pro tour does that move the needle for you I don't know. Yeah. Maybe if, maybe if there's someone who is like, like they're looking at the standings and they're checking out the people who are still alive in the tournament and like what they're tweeting about and yeah, stuff like that. I guess you could like find these people and find their stories and uh, just kind of like put a bigger spotlight on them because when, when it's, happening it's like you know this red bull tournament there's 3500 people right like if there's yeah. an scg open or a pro tour or whatever it's like i know what 10 to 50 people that i want to follow in order to get like the full or a fuller version of the story of the tournament but for, yeah. for something like that that's, that's just like a bigger tournament or like outside the scope uh and this happens for like the mcq things too right where it's like right. oh you know like Antonino qualified or whatever. And it's like, I don't find out weeks later until they post the deck list because it's like, you know, he's not tweeting about it. And like, there was no coverage. No one was talking about it. You know, it's, it's just stuff like that where it's like, Oh, I didn't even think to follow like this person to get this update, blah, blah, blah. Right. And that does seem like something that would also be addressed by like things happening in the client. You could have those stories just displayed in front of you. Yeah. Uh, the fact that they are missing, it's problematic. I agree with you. I think a lot of it is like the circumstance and it's really hard to set that up, but also look at someone like Robert Taylor, who goes out of his way, basically to paint these narratives. Like he is how I know what is happening in these tournaments. Right. And he's, he's separate from all of this that's going on. You can follow Robert over at fire shoes on Twitter. If you want to know what's happening on the weekend. And he'll probably he's, follow you too. Right. But he's just doing this on his own. Like yeah. this isn't the official coverage. This is him taking it upon himself. And like, maybe that matters. Maybe you need to integrate Robert's efforts into the broadcast. And that's how you start building narratives. I, I mean, you and I have talked about the philosophy behind magic coverage a lot. And I think we share the opinion with Cedric and therefore the SCG tour that like the narrative matters a bunch because if you can't buy into the players playing, 
then it's just cards moving across the battlefield. And I, I think maybe that's some of what's missing here is that it's been really hard to connect with players. Again, huge portion of that is just like some of them don't have webcams and some of them aren't even streaming the event. So it's like yeah. really hard to just get access at this point. But you have to hope there's solutions. Like what is the Pro Tour going to look like? Who knows? I, yeah. I have no clue. Are they going to ask ask people to stream? Some people can't do that. Right. I mean, Arena is a high resource program in a lot of instances, and there's folks who are going to need new computers just to participate. So I don't know. It, it's obviously like a very tough situation. I, this isn't me casting blame on coverage. It's just like coverage is really hard right now, and I don't know how you do it. So it really grabs you. But there, there is a sense that this matters a little bit less, unfortunately. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. And it's not even about like mattering less. It's just like, obviously it's different and I just don't know how to interact with it to get the same experience that I was getting with these old tournaments. Mm, and I don't right. think that there have been any steps taken to make it the same or better than the old tournaments. And I, I mean, the tournaments are happening. They're still successful. Like maybe this is just like a, a me and you thing. And sure. it's not actually a thing that the public at large needs. You know, I, I don't know. But uh, certainly I think the stuff that Robert's doing is huge. And I was actually wondering why, like, no one has either just like picked him up to do that or they have not started doing that on their own. But again, you know, like maybe it's just not worth it for them. That would be completely understandable. Yeah. I mean, who knows what the return on these things is? I, I'm not even going to speculate, but they've put a lot of resources into making this work and um, i mean like attendance seems fine it seems solid i don't i don't know what they were expecting as far as viewership viewership is less than i would have expected i don't know what they were expecting so it, it's hard to say if you're getting your return on setting all this stuff up and whether you can afford to expand it i mean look this is a money making venture for the people involved as are all tournaments so if the money's not there, there's only so far you can go with it. Yeah. And I mean, that that's the thing that I want to stress to you. And you've stressed it a few times already where obviously, you know, like their funds and their options are very, very limited. And I don't think that they're even supposed to, you know, look at how to increase that or whatever, because the return on it is almost certainly not good. Um, but even just as far as like a production value type of thing, it's like, you know, what, what would help me? I think it is just trying to get more of the story out there, but I don't know the best way to do that. And I, but I think that it's also that sort of thing is like probably pretty low cost, you know, like that's, that's someone yeah. like Robert doing what Robert's doing. Yeah. I, I, I get what you're saying. Uh, so basically the moral of this episode is Red Bull pick up Jerry Channel Fireball pick up Robert, and then things are just in a good place. Everything is copacetic at that point, and the world can move on. Better place, at least. Yeah. I will I will stream me drinking a Red Bull and enjoying it. <laughs> For how long? Every me, day? Can you do well, eight hours of Red Bull drinking per day? I, I, if I, if I was just like chugging Red Bull for eight hours, I would not make it the full eight hours. I can assure <laughs> well, you no, that. You can, you can sip, you can maybe make Red Bull infused cocktails, talk about your favorite Red Bulls, Red Bull trivia, like just go hard on the Red Bull setup. Maybe. I don't know. I wasn't thinking that it would be that extravagant. I was just thinking like, you know, once a day I would just stream myself for like a minute, just drinking my Red Bull. Maybe, maybe not like my morning Red Bull. Cause I'm like, you know super groggy when i wake up you know it, it takes mm. me a little bit to get going which is where the red bull comes in you know but like the second red bull of the day right i'll be i'll be alert and energetic could do like a quick one minute ama and then we're done it's but good yeah. to see that the arena deckless team puts the same amount of effort into their red bull streaming as they do into their magic streaming yeah man it, it'll be high quality. It just, there won't be a lot. Of it just won't happen often. Yeah, yeah. I think that sums up the arena deck list theory when it comes to the Twitch platform. Right. High quality, super rare. Yeah. High quality sometime. Well, now high quality comma sometimes. <laughs> right. All right. That's game, but it's a high quality game.
Good luck. <laughs>